everyone. I just wanted to pop in to say hi and to say thank you, thank you, thank you for all the amazing birthday wishes I've been getting. I have been reading as many of your comments as I possibly can and it's been so moving to read them. Um, some of them have really made me feel so touched that I feel emotional. I really feel emotional because it just makes everything I do so worthwhile and uh, you know I'm just I, I wish I could see you all in person and give you all big virtual hugs and big real hugs instead of just virtual ones. So big hearts and if I had emojis I would press be pressing them for all of you right now. I love you all so much. I wanted to tell you that today is a really exciting day for me. Um, not because it's my birthday but it, because it's the launch of my new book. Sensitive is the new strong. And um, it's a really special and auspicious day because I know that Wayne Dyer has had a hand in helping me to get this book out and to get it published because this is a book that I started writing after he passed away. And for me, the sign that he has a hand in it is the fact that it's launched on my birthday because do you know what? 10 years ago today, 10 years ago on my birthday is the day that, uh, that I got the email from Hay House to tell me that Wayne Dyer had discovered my story of my near-death experience on the internet and Hay House wanted to publish a book of my story. They wanted me to write the book. That was 10 years ago that email landed in my inbox on March 16, 2011. And so when I was writing this book, um, the original publication date was supposed to be sometime in 2020. But my publishers contacted me and said, oh, we're gonna have to, de uh, to, um, to defer it to early 2021 because there was a lot of backup of stuff because of COVID and staff not, coming in, not being able to come into work. And so they had to delay publication. I had no idea of what date it was gonna be. And then they wrote to me and they said that we would like the publication date to be March 16th, 2021. And how does that date suit you? And when I saw it said March 16th, that's my birthday. I was like, oh, that's a sign. That's exactly 10 years from when my first book was discovered by Wayne Dyer. And so I said, yes. So for me, that was really a sign. Um, I wanted to tell you a little bit about what drove me to write this book. It was the fact that I found out um, sometime maybe in 2016 or thereabouts, I started to realize I was an empath. So I want to say something here about empaths. Um, I have said in my first book that I believe that we are all made of the same substance and we are all uh, made of pure consciousness and I said I didn't like to divide us with labels. So sometimes people have said to me, but when you say you're an empath or people are empaths, isn't that a label? So here's where I differentiate between what's a label and what's not. A label is something that boxes you in and limits you and makes you feel small. It makes you feel smaller than who you are, where you feel you're limited by the confines of a label. Whereas when I identified that I was an empath, it didn't limit me, it actually set me free because it led to a deeper understanding of who I really am. And once I started to understand that, it brought a lot of clarity on so many things. It brought clarity as to why I react the way I react to certain things. And so now I wanna to explain to you what is an empath and why did it set me free to know that? Because, so an empath, and I discovered this from Judith Orloff's work, um, she is, uh, Dr. Judith Olaf is brilliant, she's the one, she and Dr. Elaine Aron were the ones that really put the term empath on the map. And what they say is that an empath feels things in their body. So basically, if you have like a, a spectrum, a spectrum where, uh, of sensitivity, and on one and on the lowest end of the spectrum is people who don't feel empathy, compassion, and sensitivity. So, so people who are on that lowest end of the spectrum, and again, I say lowest end, I actually mean one end, so no judgment there. If they're made that way, they're still 
children of the divine. So, but if they are on one extreme end of the spectrum and they feel no compassion, empathy, sympathy, we tend to think of these people as having um, sociopathic tendencies. So, <clears throat> you know, still we send them love, but on the other end of the spectrum, you know, most, so, so there's very, very few people on that end of the spectrum. So then you have most of us are somewhere along the spectrum with a lot of levels of compassion, empathy, sympathy. But as you go further and further along the spectrum, on the other end, you have what we call empaths. So they are highly sensitive. It's neither good nor bad, but empaths actually struggle. So what defines an empath? What makes them different from other extremely sensitive people? An empath actually feels things physically, physiologically in their bodies. Other sensitive people and intuitive people, you know things, <clears throat> you sense things, but, you, but it doesn't affect your biology. With an empath, it actually affects your biology. In other words, you can absorb other people's energy and you can even feel unwell. And it's not yours, it's not from your stuff, it's from absorbing other people's energy. Now, I have always been like that, but I assumed, so first of all, I never understood that was happening to me. I never realized that I was absorbing other people's energies and sometimes my illnesses were not mine, they were other people's, I was taking it on. But I assumed <clears throat> that everybody felt sensitivity and empathy the way I did until I started to discover that that's not the case, um, that it doesn't apply to everybody. It's maybe 2% of the, of the population. And because we don't understand it and we don't realize it, we absorb other people's emotions and allow it to get us down. And so this is what drove me to actually start to learn more about it so that I could learn more about myself. And I resonated with realizing I was an empath and I resonated with learning about it more than anything and it helped me so much. I started to understand, for example, that um, when, I was, uh, when I was sick, when I got sick and when I had the cancer, um, I had been helping a friend, a very, very dear friend, go through her illness. And what I had done during that time as she was going through her illness was that I felt so guilty or so awful about her going through her illness. So she had this illness that was um, terminal and she was gonna die. And with me, no matter, so, so I felt that I literally stopped my life just to be there for her because I felt so bad for her. I felt her pain as if it was my own. Empaths have a tendency to do that. We have a tendency to feel other people's pain even more than our own and there's no separation between their pain and our pain and what I was doing was her situation was so dire that any problem I had didn't compare to hers so I would put my problems aside and and just kept focusing on her life even when I had problems and issues that would build up even when I was feeling tired even when I was feeling exhausted I was like oh, my problem is nothing compared to what she's going through, and so I would be in there helping her, just neglecting and neglecting my own needs. And the world and the universe kept sending me wake-up calls to take care of myself, but I wasn't listening until one day when I felt a lump on my neck, and I went to the doctor, and the doctor suspected it was something quite serious and did a biopsy, and that's when they discovered I had lymphoma, and then a scan showed that it was at stage two. Now, the thing is that I don't want to scare you if you're an empath or anything, because the point is you can actually avoid all these things if you understand who you are. And that understanding has taken me years to come by. So, um, so what happened though is that with that diagnosis, of course I felt all this fear. But also what I remember feeling was, ah, oh, I get to take care of myself now. And so it was like that illness gave me a big enough reason to put myself first. And what I want you to know is that you don't need a reason to put yourself first. Empaths, because they feel the emotions of other people so strongly, 
They tend to put everyone else before them. And <clears throat> I noticed that even after my NDE, even after I've been out on the world stage, I still had a tendency to do that. And so I have to figure out how I can learn how to use my traits. Um, so I had to figure out tools and I had to learn how to use my traits as gifts. Empaths have a lot of gifts. So, but going back to that story of me then feeling that, that, um, that oh, now I get to take care of myself. So my big message here is you don't need an illness as an excuse. You need to know that you are worthy and deserving of taking care of yourself regardless. And, that, and you need to know that if you are an empath, you have a tendency to, um, to think of other people's problems and other people's emotions before your own. So be aware that you have that tendency to do that. Um, the thing is, what happened um, with, with, with me is that when Wayne Dyer discovered my story and then shared it with the world, um, he was, it was amazing while he was alive and he was almost like a buffer between me and, and the world. But after he passed away, I had to learn to navigate this whole world. My world had suddenly blown open and become bigger than it was before I had the NDE. And so I found that I was absorbing everybody's emotions. But at, at that point, I still didn't know I was an empath. And when I learned I was an empath, that's when I felt, oh, now I understand. And as I said, it actually set me free to learn this. So here's the thing. That's when I really started to think about this. And I started to think, I need tools to help navigate this world. I need to understand what are the gifts of being an empath. Like it feels like a hindrance that all we do is absorb other people's emotions like a sponge. We need to know what our gifts are. And so I went on a road to self-discovery. And this book that I've written is very different from the other books that I've written before on empaths. The other books <clears throat> are excellent. They paved the way for me. They helped my understanding, but they are written more from research and more clinical. Mine focuses a lot more on the gifts of being an empath and it focuses on the spiritual and intuitive side, on how to hone those gifts. Because the gift of being an empath is that empaths are far more intuitive than most people. Empaths are also much more in tune with their higher self. They are more psychic, if you will. Um, if you are a psychic, a healer, a teacher, a clairvoyant, if you are in the healing arts, chances are very high that you are an empath. And people like this, you are out there helping people all the time. You need to know this, that with these gifts comes a responsibility of taking care of yourself. You need to know that a lot of the traditional spiritual teachings, the teachings that tell you that it's better to give than to receive, that you must always be of service to others, you must, um, that spiritual work has to be done for free without money. These things don't apply to you because you are different. You are different. The traditional spiritual teachings actually set you back because here's what I discovered. As I was on this bigger life with the books and the speaking engagements and a big audience and I wanted to help everyone and I would feel sad and guilty if I couldn't help everyone, I started to feel that same feeling of getting worn down again. Um, what I wanted to do, and when I realized I was an empath, I wanted to search out mentors who were successful in every way, mentally, emotionally, physically, healthily, um, abundantly and who were empaths. I wanted to seek out empath mentors who had actually made it, who had leadership roles. And I struggled. I could barely find any empaths who were like out there in the limelight in leadership roles who had, who had good health, vibrant health and, and abundant and so on. So as I tried to identify empaths among us, um, I realized, okay, Gandhi, he was one that came to mind. Mother Teresa, another one that came to mind. Edgar Cayce was another one that came to mind. He was healing and healing people. And, you know, because I was thinking of big names that are, that are out there. 
And then I realized something. I realized all of them died poor and destitute. And Edgar Casey wasn't even old when he died. He died quite young and he was sick. He got sick because he was constantly out there helping people and feeling guilty for all the people he couldn't help. And when he was sick, his doctor told him, you have to limit yourself to just, just healing three people a day. But he couldn't because there were so many people that needed his help. And finally he died. And so I was thinking, that's not right. Our world needs empaths. Our world needs empaths to not only step into leadership roles, but to thrive. We need, we need them to have the tools to be strong. And I couldn't find them. And that's when I embarked on this journey to write tools or to create tools for myself because I decided I don't want to be sick again. I don't want to be destitute. I don't want to suffer the rest of my life just because I'm an empath and I'm out in the public eye. I needed to do something about it. So I wrote this for me as a guide for me as I navigate this world. So it comes from my heart and these are the things that helped me. And that's what triggered me to write this book and set me on this journey. And as I wrote it, I realized that as a race, as a human race, I realized that if empaths don't embrace their gifts, then what's going to happen is that, uh, is that empaths are not going to be able to step in the, into their light. They're not going to be able to step into leadership roles. And when they don't do that, all our leadership roles are then taken by people who are on the other end of the spectrum. And then we kind of wonder, why is the world in such a mess? And so that is the inspiration behind this book. And I would love for you to read a copy. I would love for you to hear your feedback. But more than anything, the reason I came here today is because I love all of you. I have just been so moved by the support of all of you, really moved. And I wrote this book I made it, you know, even though I wrote it for me, and it comes from my heart, um, I put it out as a book for you, because I truly believe that it can help, I truly believe that it can help other people who are going through a journey like mine. And I truly believe that you don't have to suffer, you don't have to get sick, you don't have to get cancer, just because you're an empath and you feel too much. I truly believe that, and that's what drives me to do the work I do, all the work I do. Thank you all so much for listening, and I'm just going to ask Danny behind the scenes, Boo. Um, Boo, are there any comments that you would like to share or anything from anyone who's written it? He's been sign languaging to me, uh, everything, like he's, he's looking at all the emojis, and, <laughs> and I'm... And, and so he's signing to me. And anything you'd like to share? Uh, Jennifer McLean's message just popped up. We love you. Oh, Jen. Benet Arnett is watching. Ros Brooks, happy birthday. My God, all these people. Let's see. Hi, uh, Gail, this is perfect. Uh, Noreen is watching. Uh, let's see. A whole bunch of thank you, thank you, thank you, thank yous. Um, let's see. Faith says happy birthday. Thank you. Soraya says, oh, hello, Danny. <laughs> Yay. Yay. He should do a, a, a video at some point. I, I keep telling him he has a lot of fans, but he argues with me. No, 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 no. Uh, no he no. has tons of fans. No, these are the people who don't want to hear me. These yes, are the they thing. Do. Yeah. <laughs> Patricia says, happy birthday. Robin says, you're the best. <laughs> you are. Carmen <laughs> says, I believe you are right. Yay. Jessica, sending love to you. Linnell goes, I love you. I love you too. <laughs> I wish Tracy, I happy you. birthday, Anita, with cake and uh, flowers and things like that. Yes, where's Norma. my cake and flowers, <laughs> Ah, yes, the gluten-free cake. I think we're going to be doing something for dinner this evening. Yay! Hamburgers! <laughs> cake. <laughs> cake. All right, yes. <laughs> Yay! Well, thank you, thank you, thank you, all of you so, so much. Um, I love what I do. I love all of you guys. Um, I really, really do. I really feel 
that I have the best, best, best audience ever, ever, ever. Not a day goes by that I'm not grateful for all of you. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Love you and see you all soon. Bye.